the whole meeting for Monday, November the 26th. Start approval of the agenda that the November 26, 2018 Committee of the Whole meeting agenda be adopted as presented. So moved. Thank you. Councillor Smith. Second. Second. Councillor Benlock. All those in favor? Opposed? Carry. Two. Adoption of the minutes that the uh, minutes of the Committee of the Whole meeting held November the 13th, 2018 be adopted as presented. Thank you, Councillor Erickson. Councillor Thrawn. All those in favor? Thank you. Opposed? Carry. Our delegation tonight is to uh, have a presentation of the District of Hope Food and Agricultural Plan. And our guest tonight is Janine De La Salle. Thank you, Jeanette. Nice to see you again. Come on up, yeah, please. Okay. Thank you. The floor is yours. Well, look, um, the version I have is Adobe. It's just Adobe. So okay. Maybe can I stand over by you? Would that be okay? Yeah. Wherever you're comfortable. Oh, sure. I mean, yeah, either way. Yeah, it didn't. Um, it wasn't set up. that came forward in the plan would have 
apply to. This is within the context and acknowledgement that, you know, hope is a center for, you know, there's communities up this way, down this way. Um, there's other places that are going to be impacted and, and, and be impacted by and impact the food and agriculture scene and hope. So in the plan, you'll see acknowledgement of that and some ideas on how to connect those dots. Um, this red line doesn't say the plan doesn't talk about anything else, but we did want to be focused in on, on hope proper. Um, the, so the interesting thing about agriculture and hope, as you probably know, is you know, actually got fairly large, you know, uh, 3,200 total hectares of farmland at home, which is actually quite a lot of land. But it's chopped up really, really small. So that was our planning challenge. How do we, how do we think about agriculture in these lands when the, the parcels are so small and they're, they don't lend themselves to, say, conventional agriculture business models? So that was one, of, one thing we were really trying to figure out and be, get creative with during this process. So where we landed with our vision, and I'm just going to read this part out here. So the vision for the planning, again, this was created, um, you know, I, I was there to provide some draft content and ideas and get the thinking going. Um, the first vision statement I put up there is totally different, so this is really coming from the advisory group. So our vision for Food and Agriculture and Hope is, Hope is known as a community where food and agriculture systems contribute directly to shared prosperity and growing, raising, making, selling, eating, and recovering food. There is a cultural, sorry, there is a culture of mutual support that enables a diversity of activities and increases the resilience of the local food and agriculture system. Boutique, innovative, niche, and niche food and agriculture services complement the natural landscape and mountain town feel of the community. And regenerative and responsible practices and lifestyles are at the heart of a welcoming, tight-knit community of small-scale, independent producers, processors, restaurants, retailers, and artisans. So that was one of the things that the, the, was a, a, a core feel in the community, that there was this opportunity to be mutually supportive. Um, and there's more than enough demand out there, if only we could get to that critical mass of, of production and um, processing. And you know, having said that, we also, part of this plan is to think about food security, not just for those who can pay for the um, items that say the farmer's market or uh, the grocery store, but for everyone in Hope. So there we really did look um, across that kind of spectrum of basically income. I won't read these goals out because I'm going to go into those in a minute, and the values are just these um, things that we felt were really important to guide the plan. So striving for cre creativity, artistry, and innovation, that's how do you make money on a five acre parcel of land or two acre parcel of land. Um, collaborating a lot, deepening understanding around the many elements of food and agriculture, given that it's a kind of a, a, a relearned or a new thing um, for hope at this point. And then respecting the watershed and ecosystems that support the egg systems. So just jumping right into the, the nuts and bolts of the plan. So the first one, the, the first goal is support small lot farming activities. And within that, we look at we look at land matching. So there's organizations already out there on the ground doing land matching. So this the recommendations in here are about how to connect to that. If someone's already doing it, we're not gonna say we're gonna do it, right? Let's, let's link to the young agrarians and see if we can pull some of those disenfranchised um, youth, or not, not youth, but you know, people under 40 from Vancouver who can't buy a house, want a farm. There's a lot of them. They could come to Hope. Um, objective 1.2, support producers in navigating local and provincial regs. This is one thing that came up. Sometimes there is support for farmers in terms of business planning or crop planning, but it's really difficult um, to sometimes find where those services are. How do I access them? How do I get support writing a business plan? I want to develop a product. Who do I go to? What are the regs on that? What kind of kitchen can I use? What kind of kitchen can't I use? All of this stuff. So one of the, it was the idea to, to funnel that down and, and try and support by streamlining some of that. And then encourage, encourage support in agriculture uses. So this is, you know, for example, on-farm processing. Uh, things that you can do within the ALR that are fully permitted within um, the regulations um, that support agriculture uses. Goal two, encourage ecologically responsible agriculture and related industry practices. So this comes, you know, of course, being on the river and the flooding, there's, there's some new considerations for how to manage that going forward. Um, that's one example. 
Uh, manage land and water resources responsibly. So this comes down to you know, how do we draw uh, water for irrigation in a way that makes sense at peak season uh, without drawing down too much so it affects say, salmon habitat. Um, this, this one encouraged bee health and discouraged invasive species. So there's, uh, this was something I learned as part of this process. Um, orchardists, you know, a lot of folks in the valley will basically rent bees and they'll come and put them up and so they pollinate. Uh, those bees, when they go back to their sort of like home or where their home, their headquarters are, they can be very aggressive and if you have a just a uh, community hive nearby, they can be sort of cannibalized. So they're just, the behavior of the bees are really different. So this was kind of considering how do we make sure all bees are sort of um, healthy, considering they're sort of at the root of, um, you know, plants that will create food for humans. Um, and then, of course, looking at uh, not forgetting about waste and thinking about how we can treat food waste as a resource, both for com uh, competitive advantage for food businesses, but also for food sharing um, and in hope. The third goal, support growth and processing value added and sales activities from made in hope products. So the first one, thinking about direct mar marketing opportunities for local producers. So this is thinking about your farmer's market and how you can um, build that up over time to be a really strong center where people can test products, sell products, and basically um, it creates a big business incubation kind of feel. And that's how a lot of farmer's markets are functioning. Um, expand food hub capacity. This was a, an idea that had come forward previous in the food assessment that the Hope Food Collective conducted. The idea of a food hub is you cluster different food activities in one place to take advantage of, of synergies and overlaps. So this is an idea that we're continuing to try to figure out what does that look like? Is it a community focused food hub? Is it a commercially focused food hub? Is it some kind of hybrid? what's in here, you know, we didn't land this one, but it kept coming up as we need some of this infrastructure. So we left it in here sort of to not lose it, but then there needs to be some more work on this. Food trucks, um, support food trucks. You know, bringing food trucks in is like the farmer's market is a, is a way, uh, a lower barrier uh, for new businesses to get into the market, try and test their products, um, generate revenue for themselves, and, create kind of like um, healthy food lump, uh, options for the lunch crowd or you know what, what, what have you. A lot of food trucks in Vancouver are brought to for special events and um, it's, a, it's a really um, it's, it's really handy actually sometimes to have that. And uh, attract local, regional and or provincial scale food and beverage processors. So you do have um, some very nice industrial land here um, you know uh, breweries, not just microbreweries, but breweries, period, are one of the high, highest margin kind of ag product industries right now, probably other than cannabis. So um, you have to make good beer, having said that. Um, but thinking about those kind of larger scale uh, processors and if, if they could be located here, um, anywhere in your industrial area or, or anywhere else that would be appropriate. Goal four, promote, uh, uh, sorry, promote food and agriculture opportunities and hope. Uh, so this is really about creating that brand and that feel that there's something different happening in hope. There's something special happening around food and agriculture here. And it's going to create a magnetism. And you're going to attract entrepreneurs. You're going to attract farmers. But you're also going to attract people to come and buy those things. So this is really working. Um, I was really impressed by the, the current branding that you have for hope. Not only do you have a couple of different logos, but you a community logo that can be used. Um, so you've already done a lot in your brand environment. How can you leverage that brand environment to communicate that there's something special happening in the around food and agriculture? Uh, develop marketing communication systems for promoting food and egg and hope this is kind of your basic, you know, keeping your website up to date, considering things like social media to promote different things like the farmer's markets day or if there's something special happening um, with one of the social service providers or meal providers um, to, to help promote that. Sorry. Goal five, enable a diversity of learning environments for food fiber and farming. Um, so, you know, this idea of education really came through quite strongly. Um, people recognize that a lot of us need to relearn food skills, you know, whether that's how to grow, how to preserve, how to create a healthy meal on a, on a budget. 
Um, these are all things that um, really overlap well with the Hope Food Collective's work and the um, thinking that went into the initial food assessment here. Uh, celebrate food and agriculture throughout the year. Uh, farmers markets are a great way to kind of do it in the summertime, but how do you keep that energy throughout the year? How do you say, um, you know, celebrate um, your farmer of the month or some kind of, it could be playful, it doesn't have to be, you know, serious, but how do you basically bring people together in a fun way to eat and drink and do other stuff? And food's a great way to get people into a room. It's like the number one trick. So um, that's, that's, a, that's a fun one to work with. And it also can work with the celebrations you already have in place and just integrating a food component. Communities have worked that, worked that one that way as well. Um, increase opportunities to reclaim high quality food for redistribution. So there's a lot of food and waste in our food system. A lot of perfectly good food is thrown away. So this objective considers how can we reduce that waste and bring that high quality food um, back into the community. Goal six, empower plan stewardship, governance, and implementation. Um, so the first one here is identify a uh, lead food and agriculture advisory group. Who's going to support you all, mayor and council, in implementing this plan? There's a lot of stuff in here for the district to, to look at and, and to work with, but there's also a lot of other stuff that involves partnerships and community organizations, businesses, and others. How do you keep tabs on this plan. Um, uh, the idea of an advisory group was really supported by the um, sort of temporary advisory group we had set up for this project. And the, currently, um, this is sort of in process. The Hope Food Collective is uh, sort of developing terms of reference to sort of uh, uh, be broader and to encompass the Agriculture Advisory Committee. Um, and then the second one here, ensure resources for the plan. Um, and resources for plan implementation are in place. And these are Joe's chickens here. These are Joe's girls that I've had a chance to go and visit. So if you guys know Joe, he's got a, quite an intense um, configuration of a bunch of different things happening and he's incredibly enthusiastic about food and growing and selling it. And um, So he, he was a lot of fun working on this. This isn't intended to be read. This is just to, just to sh put it up there. So when we, when we got through writing everything, we really wanted to put an, uh, a meaningful implementation strategy together. So what this strategy does is it delineates District of Hope, Advantage Hope, Ministry of Ag, the province, um, the Hope Food Collective, and I believe the um, Fraser Health Authority. And we looked at ongoing tasks, phase one tasks, phase two, phase three tasks. And so these are all itemized out. Um, little circles are supports, big circles are lead. Um, it's very spelled out. In addition to that detail, um, there's another level here, which is our critical path forward. And so we took, we created four categories within all of the recommendations. What are the quick starts? What are we ready to do? What's low cost? And what's a medium to high priority? What are some of the big moves where we're not ready, it's a medium to high cost, but it's a high priority? What are some enabling actions? So things that are high priority action areas that are necessary to support the whole process. And catalyst activities, things that will, are high priority areas that will help to mobilize other actions. So, so sometimes I find that implementation is where plans are weak and where you risk having that plan that sits on a shelf and it's not clear how you move forward with it. So we cut the implementation plan at, at least four different ways and that overly complicated table here is kind of where that is all situated. So hopefully that's clear uh, to read and Steph and Brittany are uh, interpreters of this table um, and also owners of this table because there was a lot of horse trading that happened in here uh, when we were deciding who was lead and who was support. So this has already been sort of vetted through that lens of feasibility. Um, so I just wanted to give you an example of some of these things, but I don't want to take up too much time. Actually, maybe we can come back to that. If anyone had questions on what is or what are specifically in these categories, I'd, I'd be happy to speak to that. Uh, but that's that's it for this presentation. Hopefully, that has provided a, a clear overview, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Jenny. Get in. Right. Oh, you got it. Very good. <laughs> Is there any questions from council? Council 
I have a question regarding the planning area, excuse me, the map area. A lot of it is in the L1. Uh, the Hector is in the L1. I was, I was looking through that. It's like uh, 32, 2,300 hectares. That's mostly mountain areas. How did that fit in? Is it just because it's an additional area? Uh, yeah, it's because, I think it's probably because it's in the L1. No, I can answer that. Right. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, your worship, through you, uh, what it is, it's basically any uses that would say agriculture, the L1 zone, CR1 zone, the EG1 zone, they all have agricultural uses. So they've been applied to that map just because that use was there in that zone. Even though it's in the mountainous area and it's not, it wouldn't be agriculture, I mean, you couldn't use it as agriculture. From the arability of the land, perhaps not. Um, it's, it's just based on use, is what we can accept. So, so far. when you look at that, then you can, I'm just trying to figure out the actual uses where a little farmer can come in and say, man, it's 10 acres, I can do this. So, if you take that 2,200 acre hectares out to 3,200, we only got about 1,000 hectares in whole, really. That is. It, it really useful. depends on the type of agriculture. Like if you look at Joe's place, he's on a steep, it's messy, it's rocky, and he's pumping out more food out of his lot than probably people with nice, flat, alluvial soil parcels. So it really depends on the farmer. And what we focused on here, and sorry, it took my brain just a second to catch up. I haven't looked at this map for a while. Is we wanted to make sure that any any areas that were already permitting agriculture activities were included. Yeah, so it, is, it wasn't to say those are perfect, those, that's a super good option to go there. Um, but it is saying it's allowed. It's saying it's possible. You don't have to change yeah. any zoning or do anything to, to mm -hmm. have agriculture happen there other than get people on. Thank you. Anyone else want to ask? Thank you. Um, just to get into a bit more of the detail on that. Sorry, that's part of our regular council agenda. So I, I do appreciate how it's broken down so many different ways, it being a lot easier to kind of uh, see the priorities. And I was trying to figure out in my mind how quickly things needed to happen, and what kind of resources were needed to, to do that. So one of the ones that jumped out at me, because it's sort of budget related, I guess, um, is in the enabling action, so high priority. Uh, and that was establishing a coordinator position to provide a point of contact for inquiries. Because I thought, exactly like you just finished up saying, that it's great to have a plan, but it, it's going to sit on the shelf unless there's some action taken. And I was thinking, where in our current capacity could we fit that in? I see the District of Open Advantage will take the lead on most of those activities. Um, but they're all busy. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out where that fits in. So I assume that's why a coordinator position will be created. So then a couple pages later that talks about um, that we're not ready for that because we don't have that. Um, it is sort of medium dollars, 11 of the $50,000 range. And then in the one to two year phase, I see that as like a real key component of getting this off the ground. So I just, my, my question is, um, in your opinion, uh, what, what type of qualifications does somebody need to be in that position? And what does it pay? Whose department would it fall under? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question, and it, it is, you do need that warm body. Um, if I were to, to kind of have the ideal situation um, of that person, they'd be a generalist, they'd be very good with people, they would um, be able to basically take all these questions and show people where to go. They would have to be very knowledgeable in the existing resources. Um, they would have a direct line of communication with the ministry and multiple departments to find stuff out. Uh, they'd also be able to do website work, social media. Uh, they'd be able to convene meetings, develop agendas, facilitate. It's that kind of role that's a generalist that can be that that center of gravity for the whole thing. So if you all have questions, if the community has questions, if the business has questions, that's, the, that's your go-to person, internally with, and externally. With specific expertise in agriculture and food? or. Uh, that would be that would help. I think the other skill sets I mentioned in terms of just being able to work with people and not necessarily having those core competencies, but knowing where to go and find those, because that's that's the challenge. Because there's a lot out there. For example, like even in the region, if you wanted to find, a, say, a processing kitchen, there's already processing kitchens that people could be connected to, which is like where and how. So that person would just not necessarily be a, a commercial processing expert, but they would know 
where in mission uh, they can go and how much it's going to cost and what kind of forms they need to fill out, for example. Councillor, thank you again. I, I really appreciate you bringing this to, to us here for our attention. In Hope, we have quite a few really nice, quite a bit of real nice land loss available for farming. And I know a piece of 20 acres that's going to be coming for sale soon. Not mine, but someone else's for sale soon. And it's a beautiful agricultural land. It's in the agriculture. How do people, instead of that person putting on the market, just selling to the you know, person who buys it and sending you people for some other purposes, how do people get in contact with sellers like this and say, I'd like to have 10 acres of that or 12 acres? Or how, do, how do we go about doing this? Because once it's sold to somebody else, they may put some non-agricultural thing on it, just even non-agriculture. Yeah, how do you encourage that agriculture activity? I, I would go back to that land matching piece. So let's say um, you get into the detail of that. Uh, I think there are some ideas in the plan around not only how to sort of maybe you lease the land instead of sell it, or maybe if you're um, if you're going to sell, like, sell your farmland, maybe you contact a dish and be like, hey, do you know of any buyers for me? So again, that person um, can be that conduit where that information can flow and be um, kind of uh, recorded and then used. Um, but yeah, that, it's, it's, it's the markets. You can't control that too much. You can't really control too much of you know, how people sell their land. But you can, you can encourage them to, to try and connect to another farmer or potentially look at other options you lease the land and they have an income from that. So that there's a clear incentive there. And I really, we really like that idea when we were working on this because there's a win. There's a win on both sides. And it's not like, do it out of the goodness of your heart. No, there's a business case for it. So there's a, there's a few things we can look at there. And there's, there's, other, um, there's other tools for um, you know, getting farmers onto land that, where they don't necessarily own the land either. So there's some mechanisms and, and ideas for how to start that thinking in the plan, and it really it comes down to, I think, that, that person again, to, to know where that land is for sale. And be like, hey, I actually just talked to somebody who wants to do this kind of thing, and that's a perfect match. And if you're not sure about the soil capabilities, you can call Chris I back and ask him. So just a follow-up question. So if, does, is your group going to put together a land base where there could be farmers purchasing or leasing that this land is really good for maybe blueberries or this land is good for cows or whatever. In Hope Area where you can say this is very good agricultural land or this isn't as good at the mountain size. Is, is, yeah, are you, most are of you your- putting, Are you putting together a land base like that? Well, I think it's already there in the form of your A1 zoning and your agricultural land reserve. Because most of your land you could do, you could grow almost anything here based on your soils, your water, your, your light. The, what becomes the, the challenge is how do you get it to market, how do you contend with climate uh, changes, you know, the flooding, the, the dry summers. That's, that then becomes the viability question. So a, a, any farmer worth or, uh, you know, harvester forages, not just farming, you know, we have someone who makes birch syrup and birch water and things like that. Um, the, it's, it's not just about the land, it's like what do you do with it after that? And that's, you know, that's the, the, key, the key piece here. So I think you're, you're very fortunate you have an incredible asset in terms of the agricultural land you do have. Um, not just where you can grow, do agriculture technically from a zoning standpoint, but your actual land base. Um, so yeah, I think you can encourage that through your marketing as well, you know, thinking about like, hey, if, if anyone wants to do farming, we've got basically some pre-packaged business ideas for you. Farmers are ferociously independent, so that's not always a, a good strategy, and it's, it's failed in other industries like forestry and in certain communities like Funnel they've been learning about, but um, it's, it's, it's out there, it's a possibility. Thank you. Councilor Smith. Hi, yeah, thank you. Uh, the community you have was the best people you could possibly have. We, they are they are passionate about agriculture and area. And as, as you well know, the, you grow foods now, which is gonna change direction, but just shows you what you can grow in a smaller area you know, we never, 10 years ago, we never thought of that. So we have to look at things different in way and that you can produce a business. Uh, I have an article that I just looked at about doing the same thing with all those robotics now in California, of doing the same things they try to save because I want to show it to them. <laughs> but uh, I mean, it is coming and we have to relook at how we do agriculture from before, but uh, we can make this land way more valuable. So and thank you very much for your report, it's very nice. Thank you.
Thank you, Jeanette, for your presentation. I do think there's one name missing from your list at the beginning. Stephanie Hooker. Oh, I know. I know. What? Scott's up there, but I think Stephanie played a big role in this. Brittany and Stephanie are both out there. And, oh, and Brittany as well. Thank you for bringing that to my attention as well. So thank you for coming tonight. Great. Appreciate it.